Welcome. This is a March 27th Open ZFS production user call. We have Andrew, Stu, Steve, Jan, Greg, and myself, Michael. And one hot topic is that I brought up on the leadership call yesterday the notion of the developer and perhaps user summit for Open ZFS, which has traditionally been in San Francisco, but I proposed Portland, Oregon. And the feedback so far has been positive. I will consider you insiders and I will drop a form poll into chat. I believe some of you in, are in the Portland area and it would be great to have early pledges of help, but I've got a pretty good team and the whole kind of plug group from Portland Linux Unix group. So there's that. Um, I'm I'm all in too, Michael. You are uh, awesome. Uh, and that answer came from Stu. Stu. Yep. <clears throat> and my and I may get a sponsorship too if I'm awesome. in. The Excellent. So this may shock you, but. Portland Southwest Hills are generally a little cheaper than downtown San Francisco. So I think it could be quite interesting if we do like food carts or or a more of a social event or user content. The De Developer Summit has traditionally just been two days of highly focused developer discussions, which is awesome and critical. But with those typically taking place Monday, Tuesday, one thought is to have Saturday, Sunday user content. So that's part of the poll. And I've got that link in chat. And if I don't, let me know. So yeah, that's an ongoing going discussion. And I talked to Alan Jude, PJD, uh, Rob Norris, and others in Taipei. So this is kind of a fresh, hot topic. So there's that. Um, one thing from Taipei from Pavel talk was that little did I know block cloning uh, does not preserve its deduplication benefits on send. Was everyone aware of that? And I'm just last to know. Such that you... Um, yes, because it's uh, on, on a level underneath that, but that's one reason why I really want to punch that back in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So let's see. Uh, before we get to your nifty script, uh, Steve, you had a question about KMOD versions and user land versions. Could you give us the freshest version of that question? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so we just noticed this. I think some of these machines previously did have uh, matching uh, user space utility and kmod versions but then they uh, get auto updated and i believe we sort of stumble into this situation where um, they don't match anymore and i'm curious just if you know is this something that is sort of common um I don't need to freak out about it, or should I be a little more concerned? One small thing from my talk in Taipei was go ahead and do a search for ZFS init RAMFS, and you'll see many cries for help. Yes, as long as the ZFS is, hey, again, this help. is from my experience, if ZFS is older, then the K-Mod, you're good. Ah. If your K-Mod is equal or less than, then there are some issues. So older user land is safe with a newer kernel, is that what you said? That's that's my been my experience. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. But a a more recent ZFS versus an older KMod, especially in Ubuntu. Again, I'm cav caveating it with that. 
I have had, I have seen issues and I have forced upgrades to correct that. Mm-hmm. If I'm building from source, it's not a problem because they're the same version when I build it, but sure. If you're using the, the Ubuntu repositories, that's what I've seen. Are the Ubuntu repositories not doing the right housekeeping on update? I don't even want to start. (laughs) That's just fine. (laughs) Let me just be clear that I do not know all the layers between uh, Ubuntu and how this machine finally gets constructed. So I would hate to cast blame just yet. Yeah. Well, to be honest, my last fresh build with everything updated, my KMod is a 2310.2. Um, so the ZFS version is accurate, is the same as what's pasted, and I'm one dot dot rev higher in KMod on box that got built last week. Anything else relating to that? Or rephrase, Steve, does that adequately answer your question? Oh, yeah, that that was helpful. Just hearing, you know, from experience, um, we can sort of generally follow some rules here. And so related, that's a big old 2.2.0. Have our friends in Ubuntu land updated that to work around any block cloning issues, especially with a topic on the agenda relating to that. Well, being there generally slow to get it into the repository, I would assume not. Righty. As far as I know, we are not using uh, any block cloning features. Oh, few are, but there were known issues and yeah, right. you don't want to Forget about the fact that this particular rev might have issues. Um, does is there any um, support yet for for utilizing that? So system calls like uh, copy file range um, allow access to that functionality. Uh, Linux has a few more ways to access it when FreeBSD and. One of the reasons uh, why we even noticed the bu- bugs in Open uh, ZFS 2.2.0 is that uh, the latest core utils uh, f- from the GNU project uh, released a few days or weeks prior um, finally made use of copy file range to accelerate uh, normal file copying. And that's what uh, exposed the bug in, free- uh, uh, sorry, in ZFS. Because uh, it has been there for years, but with copy file range, uh, you could find, and block level cloning, you could finally get into the situation that it's common to observe this bug instead of a once in a lifetime uh, bug, even if the underlying problem was there for years. It's just that it was hard to uh, expose before. So common command line tools like CP supported. Uh, on FreeBSD, install and cat also. Actually, for what it's and worth, I, off the top of your head, um, do you have a list? Where so on, on Linux, I've heard that uh, CP from GNU Core Utils, uh, after a certain version, makes use of it. On FreeBSD, CP install, no. Not tar. Sorry. Yeah. CP install and a cat. I don't know oh. what does it in uh, Linux other than CP. And what, um, yeah, last major version of core utils, whatever that is right now. So only the CP command to your knowledge? No, I don't know that it's only CP, but I have read report that CP does it. Okay, cool. I just do not know about the rest. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so that's one to fill out. I grabbed time. through the FreeBSD uh, sources and found that CP install and cat make use of it. Oh. Uh, and not much else. Uh, oh. 
but uh, anything which makes use of those then can potentially uh, profit from that. So anything which invokes CP um, or cat or install. Yeah. I have a quick one from just a minute ago. Uh, users had internal and external IPs on a Chelsea card and found that doing so disabled the hardware offloading. And it very much supports v multiple VLANs, but having multiple IPs confused the card and their, you know, the simple workaround is just don't do that. So that uh, took some much investigation on their part. So I will share it with you to help you if you hit that situation. Uh, Greg, you had hit some, I don't know, surprise challenges a few weeks ago. Are you in, in doing uh, smooth sailing at your end? Um, yeah, it's been fairly quiet the last uh, two weeks. Um, tomorrow, we're uh, finally turning on and adding that extra petabyte of storage to our uh, ZFS Colo server. Right. Yeah, it took a while to get the rack business uh, sorted out. They, for whatever reason, thought that 110 volt three phase uh, was a thing. Um, they misunderstood that we needed 208 three phase, but oh, wow. anyway, yep. yeah. Um, I, I did have a question. I, I haven't gone down this avenue and I was, I was about to, but um, I started playing around with ZFS Sun because uh, I'll admit that I've been using rsync to uh, synchronize between two uh, ZFS servers. Anyway, um, I noticed that ZFS and isn't as fast as uh, parallel rsyncs. And I was doing some research, and a friend of mine suggested that I feed the ZFS and into mbuffer, um, which is available on both FreeBSD and Linux. I will uh, paste a usage example of what he suggested here. As, anyway, the uh, question was, um, has anyone used mbuff to uh, help push along their uh, ZFS sends? I haven't used mbuff, but I've had the opposite problem, where the ZFS send-receive combination would saturate the network connection. Of my hosts. Interesting. And so I you so I was using a PV in order to limit it. PV? Okay. Yeah. You were yeah. is that it? I'm sorry, come again? Is it called, is that short for pipe viewer, I believe? Yeah. Pipe viewer, okay. So that's like a QoS uh, thing? Um it just it it just contr uh, controls well it's really for showing how much data has gone through, so you can tell it, so, so it can give you like a nice visual. Oh right, right. I'll show you. Yeah, I'll show you how far into the file well, it's gone and some other stuff. But yeah. it does have a setting for limiting your your transfer rate. Okay. So the problem most of the time with ZFS send is the bandwidth delay uh, product of your connection uh, and your socket settings. So the ZFS send and receive commands don't do much uh, buffering. They just write to a file descriptor, then they have a block or read the next one. So if you have uh, any network issues in between or just anything but the local network or more than, let's say, 10 gig or so, you really have to put a buffer in between. I found that the guide should be like, you want about three to five seconds worth of transfers for bandwidth uh, as buffer size, okay. so that you can uh, decouple the producer and consumer without. Uh, so, and if you have back pressure uh, on either end, that the buffer is large enough that the network can renegotiate the TCP bandwidth without running low. So that's the 
reason why people uh, recommend commands like buffer or mbuffer. Um, what size of pipe are you on, Greg? It's a it's a ten gig dark fiber. Um, it's less than two kilometers. It's a physical dark fiber, not not dark fiber as a service. Right. And um, there's only two switches on on uh, in between the the two hosts. And and we're and talking about sub millisecond round trip times. Less than that's like a zero point uh, three, usually three or four. But um, I, I, I appreciate what you said, and, I'm, and, and I have tweaked around with, with the network settings. It's um, my experience as far as if I set off a parallel R-Sync, like three or four streams. You it, shouldn't it all, have to do that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But it will inundate the link. So um, I don't know what that, that would tell us, but uh, I definitely can get like nine point six gigabits a second almost out of, out of the line if I push it really hard. Send and receive. But with, yeah, but with a ZFS send, um, I'm seeing um, between three and on a good day, six gigabits, but it, it never sustains. Is so, there any other traffic on that dark fiber right now when you're testing that? It's... Uh, there would be, yes, yes is the short answer. Um, there's part of our uh, render farms over there, our HPC. Um, but uh, typically these jobs I fire off at around 3 at night when the line's uh, quiet. So and when my you do that, yep. when you lock into both switches and uh, watch the drop packet uh, of rain counters for uh, bursts, so that you notice if you have any uh, buffer overruns in the switches. Yeah, I, I've looked at that, and they can go weeks without any uh, dropped frames. Okay. Yeah. And your your iperf is getting you above nine point two. I'm assuming. Um, I've not ran iperf between these two particular machines, but I'm I'm happy to do that. This is the yeah. something I started to to look into um, a little while ago, like like two weeks ago. Once in a while, whenever I had a few minutes. But um, the, the, the thing that bothered me that got me to start thinking about this was that uh, some of those things aren't done in the morning when I come in and then people start wanting to use the file system, so. Yeah. So, if you can check this. First of all, if, how far you can get with one TCP connection in iper free mm -hmm. uh, Because on that latency, there isn't no reason if you don't have anything to compete with at night, so you shouldn't have to use more than one TCP connection. If you have to, you either have a very, very slow CPU on one end, or uh, so that you can't process the TCP part of the connection fast enough. So if you have like a 10-year low-power CPU somewhere, maybe mention that. Um, if not, uh, you should be able to do it with one connection. Uh, because you have no latency, you shouldn't have any packet loss, so you don't have to uh, average it out. And if you can't do it with one connection, there is a bottleneck somewhere, and most likely it's a software problem, as in bump this magic sysctl file in the sysfs or whatever it is in Linux. That's, that's what be I... A bunch I'm about to post that here in a sec. I just got to get the link back. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's uh, really that you probably have to tune your system correctly for this use, uh, use case. And yeah, unless you also do a lot of high latency traffic uh, with lots of clients, it shouldn't have any downsides. No, no, so that it takes a little bit more memory. Okay. As in a few megabytes more memory. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. I'll. Uh... Yep. That's what I use on my ten to forties. Um, are you using any kind of wrapper around the uh, ZFS send and receive commands? No, or but are you writing your own scripts? Yeah, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, there's there's no buffer or anything. Yep. So um, then I would recommend just installing a buffer on e command, either buffer or mbuffer. 
sizing it to at least 128 megabytes on each side and try again. Okay. Um, and yeah, maybe if if it has a block size, try 128k because that's the default CFS block size for large blocks. Um, so, yeah. And Daniel, you have some insights. And mm. if you're tumbling through SSH, make sure that SSH isn't the bottleneck, because unless you have the uh, high-performance networking patches, which are um, controversial for a reason, because they mess with the code without deeper understanding, but they do improve performance. And you had set your ciphers to AES uh, makes a big difference. Um, yes, and make sure you're using GCM. Right. And no compression. Right. AS, AS GCM, right. GCM, okay. AS 128 GCM for maximum throughput on an Intel CPU. A lot um, of times I think that people are, um, you know, that you, you get a, you get a little bit of a CPU bottleneck. So on a, you know, on a crappy backup server, I, I do multi-threading and saturates the link. Uh, you don't really need, I, or I don't really get much out of squeezing, you know, a couple bits out of not using SSH and just, you know, because of the, you know, security and all that stuff. It's just worth it to me to just multi-thread on SSH with AES. And I get, you know, I get pretty, pretty good performance. If you want even more performance, you may want to experiment at least in FreeBSD with uh, IPsec transport mode. Uh, basically run a Telnet service and you can tell something like I need to require per socket IPsec yes. policies and then you make, you can't have a missing policy because uh, before INAT hands off the socket to your script, it attaches a po IPsec policy for mandatory encryption in both directions to the socket. Uh, mm. Works with strong swarm, but it's a pain to configure. I'm not concerned one. about encryption because um, it is a dark fiber. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm silly for saying that, but but yeah, encryption isn't isn't a big thing in between these two sites. Oh, you mentioned multi-threaded SSH. What controls that? Oh, just just if you have. I mean, if it's a single stream. I mean, obviously <laughs> you're cooked. That, that then you're out of you're out of options. But no? if you have multiple streams to move. Oh wait, you just said no, Jan. Please correct uh, me. Is Enlighten the, us. Uh, high performance <laughs> networking uh, patch set for SSH. It's uh, available on a lot of Linux distributions as a different package and even as a port option for the SSH port on FreeBSD. And then you can have multi-threaded so encryption and decryption on a single SSH connection with a thread pool. Um, it used to be required before we had hardware encryption and fast CPUs uh, to saturate I'm more than, let's very... say, one gig, but that's, uh, I think they removed some of the multi-threading because it's no longer needed for pure SSH because they assume that anyone has, uh, sorry, for pure block encryption because anyone has uh, AS and I enabled CPUs these days, but you still have to use it for other ciphers like ChaCha, which can also be very fast thanks to but wide not CMD great, implementations. Not as good. Not as good for streams. Cha Cha is not not as good for streams. It is. It's good for interactive. Uh, I'll I'll fight you on that. <laughs> uh, so it depends on what hardware you have available. If okay. you have an Intel CPU with the G the problem is that on a lot of uh, ARM based systems, for example, or other non X X D eight systems, you may have a hardware IS encryption engine which is fast. But you're lacking the careless 128-bit uh, multiply instruction to quickly compute the G hash as part of the GCM uh, assisted encryption with additional data mode. So then you're limited suddenly by your uh, message integrity instead of message encryption. So there, and ChaCha can scale 
because it only uses basic integer operations to however wide your um, SIMD units are. So on AVX 512, it's really close, scary close to hardware encryption. Uh, so uh, if you have, and you can throw as many CPU cores at it as you have, uh, whereas on some systems, the hardware encryption is not part of a CPU, so uh, you can add more CPU cores, but you go, don't get a faster crypto engine. So, so it really depends on your hardware. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the modern ARM servers, though, wouldn't, wouldn't they have AES in kernel? I mean, AES on chip? Or... Um, everything except for the Raspberry Pi, which for some reason managed to pick the one modern-ish ARM core which lacks this, has IS, but the GCM part then becomes your bottleneck. So I think I would like to see that. It requires that you have a constant time careless uh, multiplication uh, function. And that's the part which is often lacking. Ah, interesting. Um, so I also like you to could see then the... do something like uh, IS SHA-2 if you have both in hardware, which is not uncommon on ARM. But I don't know if then your Intel CPU could keep up because Intel, for stupid uh, market segmentation reasons, has a working uh, SHA-512 and SHA-256 engine, but restricts them to the Xeon D and other low-power CPUs for the longest time. So, And AMD finally added that part, but I think only on Zen 3 or something like that. Don't quote me on that. No, I think no, a good to-do list testing item would be to see if the... Yes. Um, the patched SSH with the multi-threading delivers faster uh, ZFS streams than uh, than a single than a single S, uh, SSH stream without. Yeah, but I mean, you really would have, have to, be to both measure sides, on right? the hardware and software combination you want to put in production because it depends on the minutia of which CPUs you pick. It's not even easy to say uh, if it's this age. For a reasonable age bracket, uh, it ha supports ASNI and careless multiplier. Uh, so, Intel desktop CPUs, uh, and for the last few years, yes, AS GCM is the fastest. Uh, for anything other, it's an open question. What was the multiplier you mentioned? Uh, a careless multiplication instruction. Uh, wow. Um, there so, a fancy um, name the feature? CMOL instruction, which came, I think, a year after the encryption instruction. Uh, you're looking for CMOL on Intel. And on ARM, uh, I don't know the exact instruction, but it is available on hmm. recent ARM cores. But again, you have to have an implementation which takes advantage of that. And yes, if you, if you run a desktop distribution at front run, if you want if network focused hardware, it's different again. It's really, you... uh, and the other problem is for a long time, smartphones, for example, had CPUs which could do IS but not GCM efficiently. So their Cha Cha and Poly 135 uh, is faster. But that's not a problem for <laughs> CFS replication. It's just not that. You can trust that ISGCM is always the best type and you never have to measure anything else. It looks so. like the mnemonic is CLMUL. Yes. Oh, okay, That's, you changed that. I think I fixed it eventually. Uh, tell Sorry. us about this PSC SSH server. What's going on here? Oh, right. I haven't heard about this in years, but is anyone using this actively? Daniel? No longer. No longer. Okay. I, when I had um, IS and E on both ends, I stopped using it because I no longer needed it. And the, the patch is basically two parts. One is the crypto part. The other is the variable uh, transmission window sizing. And that can still be used for but you can also use pick a static one if you know what 
your network conditions are. So the other big problem, especially with SFTP, is that it's from it looks a lot like NFS and has nothing to do except for three letters in the name with uh, the traditional FTP protocol mm -hmm. because it's basically a block based file access protocol instead of a, a streaming protocol like FTP. You're not starting a TCP connection and then do a, a dozen round trips and then you just stream the file content. Instead, with SFTP, you open in a handle, then the server opens that file, which basically maps the handle to the file descriptor, and then you can do reads and writes, and it's on the client to uh, send enough outstanding uh, read requests to uh, reach the bandwidth uh, delay product. And that's the problem that the default uh, SSH client for SFTP isn't smart enough to do that, so yeah. The server isn't even the problem. It's that the client just doesn't ask for enough data to be in flight. So if it's really hard to debug if you don't know uh, what's going on because then you look at it. The CPU on either side is mostly idle. The network is mostly idle. The disk is unloaded. What is the bottleneck? Yeah. Hmm. And but those uh, patches are disliked by the upstream OpenSSHD project because they're basically messing around in the code with little regard for the security of the whole thing. So, yeah. And it's not like there are a bunch of known exploits. It's just that we have designed it in such a way that it's safe to do what you're doing. There could be dragons. Cool. Anything else regarding con encryption and sends and performance? No, not for me. Cool. I hope that helps. Let us know what you find. And it's funny you bring this up. On the last day of the conference, I sat trying to do a smoke test of a copy versus rsync versus open rsync and versus a send on the same data, which happened to be just an installed user land. And I found definite issues with open rsync, which is a, a piece of software I'm rather excited about, but it appears to be broken on FreeBSD. So I will re return back on that. But it's a, it's an important question, especially as data becomes ridiculously large in production. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware there was an open rsync project. Isn't uh, there an OpenBSD is. rewrite of the original async v whatever twenty eight or so protocol, hmm. uh, discarding yeah. the latest editions which are seldom needed, because the OpenBSD project used uh, async internally and didn't like some of the problems they ran into. Well, Chris, um, which is an it. OpenBSD um, <laughs> well, yeah, but the author found that they didn't quite implement their, the protocol in their described in their paper in their software. So there were performance. No longer. No longer. They finally got that fixed. You know, the, they originally did, but they no longer do because the protocol evolved. Right. Got it. Anyway. So it's in various ports and such, and I'd love to hear your experiences with it. Open our sync. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, do you have any topics having wrote in late? Any news? Uh, no. No. Nothing, nothing too exciting. Nothing too exciting. Uh, did Zelta reach release? Um, I haven't, uh, yeah, I, I did release it, release a version of it, uh, in, in February that I have not updated yet. Okay. Um, the next series of, Changes do do change a couple of minor things, um, but the but uh, yeah. So so clone clone rotation basically meaning that it never has to delete anything on either end, and clone following so that if you um, you know if you if you clone and then if you rename and clone a source, it can it can follow that and keep the replication going. Which which I think Sanoid can do already. Okay, it's cool. just, uh I needed to make sure that mine could too. Um 
so yeah, it's a it's it's pretty good and very very modular. So the 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 so the match portion of it is is very streamable. It works just like ZFS list now, um, except it tells you the difference. It tells you the you know the delta between the two data sets, which snapshots latest, which one's next, which ones, um, you know. It, so you can you can feed it into any replication tool and or write your own. And it can it can help you identify the differences between two data sets and uh, as as fast as it can. Nice. So Jan, you wrote a dedupe script. What's that? Yep. So that script uh, is just an experiment right now. It kind of works, but it's a bit slow. So what it does is it uh, is assumes it that the, you have a Assumes that you have a sorry. Is it on a private uh, repo? I clicked the link. No, the link should be usable without. Sorry. Weird. Not. Okay. Cool. Maybe uh, are you locked? Uh, let me check. Uh, um, da -da -da -da. It should. Just it. Um, let me just grab that code and make it a public gist and so on. Mm -hmm. Not to be uh, just a second. <laughs> so this link should work for everyone. Um, Let's see. Go ahead. So go start describing. So the script basically assumes you have a ZFS pool and you want to use a block cloning to deduplicate your jails, for example. And all of the jails and the templates for them are on the same pool, but not necessarily on the same uh, data set. Because block cloning works across uh, data sets in the same pool. So this little script basically uh, is wants to uh, take some kind of user land for the jail, copy it into its directory, and then once it has a copy there, it uh, I takes the entry, uh, char 512 hash of every file, puts the file under a content address name of its char 512 hash in a well known place. If it's already there, it just uh, uses cat to, uh, deeder up the file content. If not, it uh, installs the file into place. And before it deed up the file, it uh, creates a hard link uh, in each uh, repository so that you can use the uh, end links uh, of the inodes so to basically reference count how many uh, references there are to that uh, file so that you know when you can delete uh, the file when its reference count is one because then no none of the uh, uh, GDAP user lens and references is them because if they were referencing them they would have their own hard link, so the uh, link count would be larger than one. Uh, I haven't implemented the locking to make sure that there isn't a race condition when someone basically deletes and re uh, imports the same file at the same time, but um, the writer is there, so there would have to be some kind of locking, or you just accept that if this race condition happens, a single file doesn't get deduped. Um, Hmm. So uh, that's the idea. You mentioned hard links. Does that become a problem if you have to change? No, it uh, the hard links to... are only for tracking which okay. blobs are referenced. So which file content is referenced? The hard the files are unique files. So the hard links are only to track basically which uh, jail references which. Uh, Char 512 hashes. And then the files under the name of the dataset. So in this case, uh, tag slash content, there's a full CBS user land, and then there are no hard links there. The hard links are just so that I can use the inode reference counter um, to garbage collect uh, when I delete a file instead of having to go over every 
template which it which could reference this and having to scan all files that they hash to the same hash as the file I want to garbage collect. Is that so the hard link is, portable as a script? Uh, portable as in? Between Ubuntu and FreeBSD, or vice versa, rather. Uh, it would work on a, if you have a FreeBSD system and put a Ubuntu user land on there, it would just work, I assume. But uh, it uses a bunch of FreeBSD specific uh, options, uh, for example, in uh, MV and LN to make sure that I don't know if GNU uh, core util commands uh, support the same flags. Okay, that's the question. Cool, thank you. So right now, because it's an inefficient shell script to do the uh, dedupping uh, and it then loops over the uh, M tree file with lots of subcommands, it takes about one minute to. Uh, import a user land and it takes about one second to uh, CP it out again. So to, to instantiate basically a uh, jail from this uh, template is yeah, one to 1.1 seconds on a small lab system of mine. Um, nice. And yeah, the nice f the difference compared to uh, clone-based approaches for jail management is that you can rebase them. So you can then go in after an upgrade and find the same files and just cat the content from the uh, original hash-based name in so that you can re -dd -oop, uh, after an update or something like that. Or you could even use it to do the update uh, using mtree and basically find all the files which still have the same hash as uh, in the template and then find all files in the new template which um, and just replace the content of those. So Does this do mean you are still working on your read-only clone strategy or does this yes uh, i am because those are uh, even faster to instantiate uh, cool. okay. and have less overhead but they are um, they require a bit more tooling this here is completely transparent to inside the jail because you have a writable data set of your own you it's just an optimization which is completely transparent to the jail unlike the cloning uh, yep. trickery I'm doing, yep. where you have cool. mostly read-only file systems. Now, is there, now this, I think this would require an upstream, uh, some upstream magic, but there, there's certainly no way to, uh, to keep that block cloning consistent on the, on the backup, on a, on a replica, right? Yes and no, um, not with ZFS send because as Michael just mentioned, ZFS send does not preserve this block cloning. But after you're done, you could basically use replication to clone it over and then punch in the difference. Right. Um, okay. So in what regard? Work. What do you mean um, by that? Sorry? So you could have like a you could have some sort of function on the backup server that is that is block clone aware to to yeah. recreate well, that state. Ah, yeah. Uh, okay. Can you bring up the script uh, in the next sure. tab over? Absolutely. So what I'm doing here in the, those starting in line fifty one, it reads the entry uh, and only looks at the file flex and hash and file name. The file name is always implied. Right. So it then reads in the hash the uh, BSD flex like system in immutable and the file name. So if it's uh, if it's a directory, there are no hash, so it, the file is empty, so it ignores it. If it's a symlink, it also ignores it. If it's not a file, it ignores it, and if it's an empty file, it also ignores it. So that's the if, first if. Then I use um, 
shell variable expansion to uh, strip the sha 512 equals and flex equals prefix. Then I extract the first two bytes and the first four bytes of the um, hex representation of the hash. Um, and use that as an infix in the middle of the path. Um, I make sure that in the parent directory, so in my example, var db blobs, that there's a directory named after just a dot blobs and then the first two hex digits and inside there's a directory named after the first uh, four hex digits so that I don't end up with giant directories with too many files. Similar to what as, uh, Git does um, to treat the file system as a content addressable namespace. And then, so the, in line 60, it makes sure that the, um, the, uh, basically the one true content address copy of the file content exists. Uh, so the direct before it exists, the next, the install, make sure that it is, there's a read-only file. Then I make sure that there's a directory under the jail template uh, to reference it. And then I hard link in this uh, hash named file. And if the uh, system immutable flag is set for things like the libc, uh, the runtime link, and a few other files, like less than a dozen per user land, um, I can't just write to them even as root, so I um, remove the system uh, immutable flag under its short name, uh, make the file writable in case I'm not uh, privileged. Okay, then the first command would have failed, but still. Um, then I use cat to uh, copy file range for content from the hard link into uh, the jail's own file so that the, I have now a hard link of the original hash based version so that I bump the reference count to that inode and I use ddub to uh, copy the file over uh, or oh, sorry block cloning to copy the file content uh, after what I make the file uh, read only again and we apply the system immutable flag and and if this flag isn't used, I can just use cat without the extra four command invocations. Then I go back uh, into the starting directory and uh, move the temp directory into its final place in the uh, dub blob. So you would, would use this something like uh, Looking good. Do you have things to still do on that? So you would use it something like this, and afterward it okay. would have, you would have. Uh... Um. And again, feel free to throw your. Uh, the doc is yours. Use it. Uh, Allude it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, you can't do everything at once. I'm it's trying. Sometimes yeah. trying to. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically, the the deduplicated content then lives uh, under its full name under the content subdirectory, and there would also be a hidden directory dot blobs, which then has the same structure as the dot blobs directory directly under uh, this. Well, cool. Keep us posted. And I'll stand by my statement that I think we haven't even found the most clever and cool uses of block cloning yet, because it's a new And the real uh, problem, I think, here is that it is uh, quite inefficient to do that uh, right now, because uh, 
if you end up with having to go through so many system calls uh, that and what you do is to cp-a it is you open the source file read only you open the right uh, destination file write only uh, with write permissions then you do a single copy file range uh, normally if it doesn't get interrupted uh, copy all the content over in one uh, system call and close both files again and then you process the next file so if you we wanted to really accelerate this it would make sense to uh, have a more efficient way to do that either a batch system call for the same steps or uh, push the equivalent of cp-a uh, into uh, the kernel, probably for a CFS channel program, but right now the API to access dataset content does not exist. Uh, CFS channel programs can't access files, they can only modify pools and datasets, according to what I found documented in the CFS program and page. Hmm. Uh, oh yeah. It's so, a question for you, Michael. I know, and so yeah, Pavel revealed that it's just architecturally block cloning cannot survive the send. Jan, you may have some insights more than I would. Uh, I just not really. Was... What I remember seeing on a slide about it somewhere is that basically the block cloning happens underneath the level where the FS send and receive work. So that VFSN wants to replicate this block, but it doesn't know because it just asks for the block and it gets the block. Uh, it doesn't know that it is deduplicated and a deduplicated block because that's not necessary to know. It's a, it's on one side that's neat, on the other side it's a problem for replicating it. And there isn't a good way, I think, to say, yeah, please, how to reference it in such a way that you have anything so that the receiving system would know even where to look for a potential candidate to dedub it. Because that would then be the equivalent of the bad old uh, global dedub table, which doesn't exist for block cloning. Instead, we have smaller team yeah so hopefully the videos from taipei will come out soon because pavel does explain better and his temporary workaround was simply and i hope you're sitting down just kick on deduplication at the receiving end um but that's probably not the answer we all want yeah well because we all want to just blindly send and copy and not about, have to worry about uh, it. Go ahead, Jan. Making uh, the pool by DDoP uh, less uh, painful. Right. Well, there is. I think fast DDoP is different from block cloning. So, anyway, the brilliant minds are working on it and they're doing their best. And all of this is a very niche use case. It's not that you have to have that, it's just an interesting toy to play with, at least from my point of view right now. Um, I'm really pushing the boundaries of what can be expected of the block cloning code. Someone has to. And he, of course, um, gave the example of starting a 40 gig copy at the beginning of his talk and then at the end did the yeah, block cloning version in what one second so that was cool and it would be possible to uh, get the runtime of my ddub script down by at least an order of magnitude by just rewriting it in c and not forking per file mm -hmm. uh, because that's uh wasteful but <laughs> you would only have to basically take the part which reads the m3 uh and rewrite that as a single C uh, program, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a multi a multi threaded queue where you just consume the. Well, uh, yeah. That so, be, if uh, rewritten as a utility, would it be like specifically a tree clone or a directory tree clone? Because you're. Um. It. There is no reason why you can't do it for single files. 
it's just that I wanted to uh, to make sure that I didn't have to consider that the root of this thing isn't a directory which I can enter and stuff like this. Cool. It's one more corner case to watch out. Or in C, it would be less of a problem than in shell, because then I could use uh, the open add family uh, of the something something add family of system calls and not have to worry about my current working directory and stuff like this. Cool. Well, anything else? We're an hour in. I have some... mostly... Yes, Daniel. Oh, I have some dumb clone stuff, but I can wait till next time because we're it's. You said dumb clone stuff. Well, uh, reg yeah, regular. Just how regular clones work with send and receive. I've been obviously experimenting with every imaginable way to do this, but oh, we, wow. we can talk about it. Next, we can talk okay. about it next week because it's just some interesting things like lowercase i versus capital I, and how many clones deep can you get, and like in. Like what, what origins can you target? Stuff like that. There's, it, it is, it is complete, like crazier than a soup sandwich, how it sometimes <laughs> works and how it sometimes does not work. Um, or, or there is a perfectly good reason for that, which is why I want to bring it up at a meeting. So somebody can explain to me why it works in some situations with capital I and sometimes not. And I don't know. Okay, uh, write that up if you can. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I and I. I also want to make sure that I. I don't have any yeah. any hidden bugs in my test code, and that's the reason why I'm yeah, seeing cool. bizarre behavior. But yeah, but I'll yeah. I'll be better prepared for next week. Anything else, or shall we call it? Well, thank you, everyone. Like and subscribe. And <laughs> I might start up a little mailing thread about the upcoming Open ZFS event, which may likely be in Portland, and a few of us are local. So, well, thank you, everyone. I'll catch you on the flip side. Have a good day. Thanks, Michael. Bye. See ya. Thanks, Michael. Au revoir.